So it is a pleasure and an honor to introduce Lance Olson, who is to, to, today's keynote speaker for the 53rd uh, annual conference of the France, uh, French Association of American Studies. The recipient of many fellowships and awards, among which a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Berlin Prize in Fiction, the Rockefeller Bellagio Center. Lance is Professor of Literature and Creative Writing at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. He's also a prolific writer and has written more than 30 books. Uh, 17 novels, the latest entitled Skin Elegies, published in 2021, and that has been expanded into a multimodal collaborative installation. Also, five collections of short stories, so far so good, and many essays, so far so good, and two anti-textbooks. Intent on offering inno innovative fiction as an antidote to codified categories and mainstream canon. Lance's work, both fictional and critical, not only exhibits the materiality of language, but also erases the borders between the written word and corporeality, blending the written, the visual, the sonorous, in hypermedia versions of some of his texts, for example, his novel 1001. And by the multimodal, hypermedial collaborations with video and assemblage artist Andy Olson. Lance is also one of the recurrent participants in the Biennial uh, and Now Festival, and he used to be, I think, chair of, of the Board of Directors of Fiction Collective II, which was founded in 1974, and uh, which is run by authors wishing, and I'm going to quote Ronald Sukunik, to make serious novels and story collections available in simultaneous hard and quality paper editions and to keep them in print permanently. The collective is not a publishing house, but a not-for-profit cooperative, the first one of its kind in, in this country, in which writers make all business decisions and do all editorial and copy work. In short, Collective um, Fiction 2 is a wide step away from the publishing industry, from its marketing um, injunctions. It is, uh, like the anti-textbooks uh, which Lance, Lance published, an anti-canon endeavor, if the canon is to be understood as, as the result of a carefully constructed business in literature. So just like FC2, Lance's work is polymorphous, uh, and uh, he will present us today a talk entitled, uh, let me not forget everything, <laughs> uh, entitled uh, Carnival uh, Carnage. <laughs> Carnage Carnival, sorry, the narratological politics of what the fuck. C'est juste le what the fuck que j'avais gardé en tête, mais... Uh, thanks, everybody, so much for coming, and to the AFEA organizers for putting this together, and especially to Sylvie, a dear friend over the years. Um, let me go ahead and just start with a, a quote. Uh, the American writer in the middle of the 20th century has his hands full in trying to understand, describe, and then make credible much of American reality. It stupefies, it sickens, it infuriates, and finally, it is even a kind of embarrassment to one's own meager imagination. The actuality is continually outdoing our talents, and the culture tosses up figures almost daily that are the envy of any novelist. Well, except for the mention of the mid-20th century in the first sentence, doesn't that sound like something that might have been written this morning? Um, probably was written this morning by somebody um, as he or she doom scrolled through today's news over the first cup of coffee. In fact, though, it appeared 61 years ago, March 1961, in an essay by Philip Roth, published in Commentary, the leading post-war journal committed to constructing Jewish identity in the U.S. following the Holocaust. Appeared before, that is, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr. before the social convulsions of the 60s, Vietnam and Watergate, before the moon landing and the advent of the PC, the World Wide Web, Amazon, the cell phone, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, video games, and virtual reality, before AIDS, 9-11, the US debacles in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the deciphering of the human genome, 
Before the resignation of Richard Nixon, the inauguration of Barack Obama, the emergence of Donald Trump and his Trumpniks, the resurgence of the far right with its magnification of the racist, sexist, despotic, and violent impulses innate to American culture, before the exponential growth of income and healthcare inequality, the weaponization of disinformation on social media and off, and the intrinsic dysfunction of our political and academic systems. And now look at us. This afternoon, we might be tempted to say much of what I just listed strikes us as a little quaint in its ability to shock, befuddle, and enrage. Even as we find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic that according to the World Health Organization has already claimed 15 million lives worldwide and become the third leading cause of death in the US last year. In the midst of a redefinition of geopolitics with a renewed spotlight on the horrific realities of refugeeism in response to Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine led by a general whose nickname is the Butcher of Syria. Um, and on the brink of a climate catastrophe, which may well be too late to stop and which has prompted some think tanks to begin pondering the question, how can we learn to adapt to our own extinction? And for the past 22 years, the American West, where I live and work, has suffered a mega drought sparked by that catastrophe. In California, the result has been the eruption of massive wildfires that have burned millions of acres and in 2020 alone destroyed more than 20,000 homes and killed tens of people while pumping more than 112 million tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, making the air toxic for months on end. A byproduct of that day mare has been the disappearance of lakes in the uh, West. The Great Salt Lake in Utah, for example, which has been shrinking for decades, has now reached an historic low. And if the trend continues, and there's no reason to suspect it won't, scientists predict it will evaporate entirely within the next decade or so. And if that happens, clouds of arsenic dust concentrated in the dry lake bed will blow into Salt Lake uh, on a regular basis, uh, and prolonged exposure will lead to greatly increased rates of lung cancer. So another way of saying this, things will get a lot worse before they get a lot worse. <laughs> the scale implicit in Roth's observation, in short, has changed spectacularly. What once seemed huge has been recalibrated by the events of the last, say, quarter century. Richard Powers' uh, 2018 eco-novel, The Overstory, which I understand was just, just talked about, um, about nine Americans whose relationship with trees invites its readers to contemplate the destruction of our forests and the grim implications of that loss is emblematic of this transformation. The novel's first of three sections, Roots, is initially told on the time span of trees rather than human beings, an exceptional move. Powers thereby recasts a calcified narrative arc to uh, emphasize the insignificance of the individual within Earth's 4.5 billion year and the universe's 14 billion year history. His bleak hope in that opening section seems to relocate itself in the endurance not of Homo sapiens, but those other species that might survive murder at our hands. Tellingly, that relocation undoes itself, and I think this is really interesting, in, in my department we're having this big conversation back and forth, but it undoes itself in the second and third sections of the novel as it refocalizes on human protagonists, reprivileging our time scale and troubling its argument by returning to narrative business more or less as usual. Nonetheless, the overstory teaches us something important about narrativity. Telling from an unanticipated angle opens onto drastically new possibility spaces of comprehension. And the overstory underscores a vital pair of aesthetic and existential questions. What is the contemporary novelist, the contemporary literary citizen supposed to do in view of our current situation? one that an author of Roth's generation simply couldn't begin to begin to fathom. How do we proceed in light of a challenge Annie Dillard posed decades ago? Write as if you were dying. 
At the same time, assume you write for an audience consisting solely of terminal patients. That is, after all, the case. What could you say to a dying person that would not enrage by its triviality? Annie Dillard posed that decades ago, and now we've started to grasp that our mortality is taking place on a planetary level. How do we proceed knowing in the heart of our anxious hearts that novels don't change the world? Never have and never will that we are fiddling while Rome burns. Do we damn ourselves with yet more faint optimism, trying to persuade ourselves that living in history has always been savage and today is no exception? Perhaps settle for maintaining a comfortable armchair outrage from inside our bougie retreats? I don't think so, or at least I hope not. And I want to talk about that today. Let me begin by proposing what I think most of us here already intuit, um, that while novels don't change the world, never have and never will, they continuously change individuals, change us within the world, so long as we allow ourselves to become fully present in their presence. In other words, their function has never been global, but rather local, has never been external, but rather internal. Perhaps that's why we experience such cognitive dissonance when we come across the proposition that novels don't transfigure anything. Every one of us here is a walking example of how that isn't true. We each remember the hour a novel changed the worlds within us, and by doing so changed our relationship to the worlds outside us. I recall two texts, one a novella, one a novel, which I encountered in high school that shocked me into the writing, reading, and thinking life. Before I tell you about them, however, you have to envision what a terrible student I was. I, I confess, I was that annoyingly apathetic one who sat in the back of the classroom, staring out the window, daydreaming, biding my time until the period I was suffering through was done. I wore my D average as a badge of courage and apostasy, <laughs> believing unwaveringly along with high school students everywhere that I had it all figured out. For some inexplicable reason, my 11th grade English teacher took exception with my premises. Her name was Joyce Garvin and she stood barely five feet tall, was almost eerily slight and sported forehead slappingly red hair and unreasonably large green turtle shell glasses. One day after class, as I was trying to escape without notice, she caught me and handed me a book, a copy of Kafka's Metamorphosis. She said I should read it. We could get together and talk about it if I was interested. And that first sentence we all know so well as Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a giant insect, both turned me into an author and lured me deep into the German language. The stunning labor that it accomplishes in so few words and with such mathematical grace, the abrupt blossoming of its unhinged vision and complex tone, its literalization of a metaphor that both critiques capitalism's dehumanization of the working subject and unlocks an exploration into existential alienation and disability. How could I possibly be the same person after reading it as before? And when we finished talking about the metamorphosis, Joyce Garvin offered me a full-blown novel, Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. Although there were whole galaxies I didn't understand about it, what blew me away were its reimagining of the sentence in a rural southern register, its use of interior monologue and stream of consciousness, which I hadn't met before, and most momentous for me, its embrace of Nietzsche's notion of perspectivism, a notion which I later learned arrived by way of Faulkner's own mentor, his friend Phil Stone, an attorney in Oxford, Mississippi who had graduated Yale and introduced the young wannabe outrider of overwrought romantic poetry to Marx, Joyce, and modernist art, thereby turning him into the Faulkner we recognize today. 
It's embrace of Nietzsche's notion of perspectivism, which suggests that a polyphony of voices means a multiplicity of contradictory realities, a refusal to welcome any single absolute epistemological or ethical point of view. Now, like many of us, I imagine, in graduate school, I experienced the same kind of adventure Joyce Garvin introduced me to only now several times a day. I was never the same person Friday that I had been on Monday. I recall, as many of you might, opening Stein's tender buttons for the first time and confronting passages like this. In the inside, there is sleeping. In the outside, there is reddening. In the morning, there is meaning. In the evening, there is feeling. In the evening, there is feeling. In feeling, anything is resting. In feeling, anything is mounting. In feeling, there is resignation. In feeling, there is recognition. In feeling, there is recurrence. And entirely mistaken, there is pinching. All the standards have steamers. And all the curtains have bed linen. And all the yellow has discrimination. And all the circle has circling. This makes sand. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> it's that sort of encounter which taught me how to realize I was standing before the experimental. The sparkling provocation up and down the spine to reinvent a new discourse with which to discuss the new event. In Stein's case, that had to do in part with how she deployed linguistic illegibility to create the impression of micro-arguments. Here, the last sentence indicates by its form it has arrived at a conclusion that obviously doesn't exist. While undoing logic, the essence of argument, which is to say the essence of enlightenment hope, through the use of a kind of paragrammer, where word clusters look like sentences, engage with the syntax and other trappings of sentences, verbs, nouns, and so on, yet, yet refuse to function as units of meaning. To put it otherwise, trying to navigate a line by Stein is to enter an anti-teleological activity, a zone of perpetual suspension, a process of unlearning everything I once took for granted about language and literature and the world. So what was it that I responded so, so deeply um, in such distinct modernists? And how does that commence addressing at least one corner of the question I posed at the outset of this talk? Well, last semester I taught, as I regularly do, a course on modernist intellectual and aesthetic history, in part to thank literary, theoretical, musical, filmic, dance, and artistic texts that have meant so much to me over the decades. And the first book we read, which may seem surprising, is Homer's The Odyssey. Um, and the first large question I posed to my students was why so many modernists, from James Joyce to Virginia Woolf and William Faulkner, gravitate toward it. So many of the modernist texts are actually, in one way, shape, or form, a retelling of, of the Odyssey. And one reason I offer has to do with its deep structure philosophy that rhymes with one aspect of Heidegger's. Heidegger argues that while many of us want to believe that being at home is the fundamental human condition, living proves furiously otherwise. That not being at home is the much more fundamental one. The Odyssey isn't as we usually tell ourselves about Odysseus reaching the Ithaca of the mind. Rather, it is about how the Ithaca of the mind can never be reached. Settling down is just a rumor in Odysseus's rented world. The Odyssey is about, rather, the two decades Odysseus fights in the Trojan War and then wanders, about how even when he returns home, he doesn't, in any essential sense, return home. Um, the suitors have overrun the place. Penelope doesn't recognize him at first. Odysseus is no longer the young man who set out all those years, all those bodies, all those beliefs ago. Kafka, Faulkner, and Stein searched for fresh narrative modes in which to tell what they perceived as a chaotic, cruel, bewildering present in which not being at home was a heart-slamming given. 
the mythic journey underpinning the, Bundr underpinning the Bundrens family uh, and as they lay dying through flood and flame from their farm in Jefferson to bury their matriarch Addie is straightforward to track. In Kafka though, that sense of not being at home moves from the landscape of the natural environment into the landscape of the unnatural body through Gregor's transformation. There the corporeal becomes a strange horror show, a kind of haunted house. Odysseus's helter-skelter Mediterranean basin where the pteratoids turn out to be our own ever-shifting flesh. And the Thamza apartment blurs into precarious fever dream. In Stein, the terms change again, placing the reader into the role of nomad among a language that rejects the domestic coordinates of signification. The modernist project, that is, was an attempt to reinvent ways to narrativize an uncertain contemporary, but without completely abandoning or completely perpetuating the past. Of course, that project isn't unique to them. It has been the most important undertaking for those of us invested in experimental writing practices since, let us say, by way of approximation, the late 19th century. The question that serves as its engine is one succinctly voiced by Jean-Francois Lyotard in 1979. How do we present the unpresentable? While well, Lyotard frames that uh, reasoning around the Kantian sublime, I'd like to go elsewhere by rephrasing it, posing him without him. How do we present a contemporary that feels beyond presentation itself? By way of tentative answer, let me bring to the surface what has so far remained my mostly subtextual argument. Every form suggests a philosophy. Let me say that again. Every form suggests a philosophy. If that's true, then writing doesn't simply embody its thematics at the stratum, for instance, of character, dialogue, setting, leitmotif, symbol, and so forth. The textual loci we have become habituated to uncover and explicate, but also at that of structure itself, which is to say among the architectonics of everything from story organization to page design, image layout, sentence construction, font choice, and other cultural interpretive invisibles. It seems untenable to repeat ossified forms as much as it does to repeat ossified conceptions of character, which is to say ossified conceptions of selfhood. Arrangement, which is to say ossified conceptions of epistemology and telos. Setting, which is to say ossified conceptions of the world. And the rest, whose deep assumptions have led us to the calamity called 2022. Doing so strikes me at best as rea a reactionary reflex and at worst as exemplar of a kind of willed blindness. The danger intrinsic in that move is that it consciously or unconsciously sustains received narratives, which is to say consciously or unconsciously sustains received systems of knowing. And as Trump and his Trumpniks fathom only too well, to paraphrase a quote often inaccurately attributed to Goebbels, even though Goebbels said things almost like this, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. If we structure our narratives familiarly enough, reproduce them frequently enough, people will eventually come to assume those structures tell us something true about how our universe works. That, for example, complexity and conflict in human relationships can unravel, as romantic comedy instructs us, into easy resolution, especially if it stars Hugh Grant. Or, as detective novels instruct us, um, reason and careful collection of evidence can lead to certitude. Or, the plot arc of life, as many memoirs instruct us, is fundamentally fundamentalist Christian in nature. A fall from innocence into sin that leads through tribulations to redemption. Yet don't the catastrophes I mention above, this carnage carnival in which we are complicit, imply rather that our cosmos arrives as shrapnel, not logic or illumination?
and that the only telos we can be sure of is a continuous anti-teleological condition of flux, uncertainty, and question till death do us part. The feeling is akin to the sense you sometimes get when rapidly surfing the web, an ongoing disorientation followed by orientation followed by disorientation in a data hurricane. Information sickness, Ted Mooney called it prophetically in his 1981 novel, Easy Travel to Other Planets, in which overwhelmed pedestrians now and then drop in place along New York streets and curl into fetal balls, bleeding from the nose when it all becomes too real. We disrupt narrative structure not because it's fun, though it most definitely is that, and not because it's gimmicky, it most definitely isn't that, but instead because, as the protagonist of Lydia Yuknovich's novel Thrust, which appears in the US later this month, knows, stories are quantum. Stories, seriously, self-reflective <coughs> narratives written here, now, are the antithesis of Newtonian. They exist in multiple, in simultaneity, from manifold perspectives, shot through with skepticism, active interrogation, and fierce uncertainty, set in relentless resistance to the received complacency, the received whistling in the dark that has made the world this world. Through the constant act of disturbance as a way of being, a passionate permanent incarnation of the examined life Radical narrativity asks us to envision the text of the text, the text of our lives, and the text of the world other than they are, and thus asks us to contemplate the idea of fundamental change in all three. It acts as a portal for change while foregrounding marginalized subjectivities, alternative positions, new ways of experiencing experience, past and present, of envisioning all tomorrow's parties and all our funerals, all at once. I was asked last month by an interviewer why exploring the dark spaces doesn't lead me to give in to despair. I discovered myself answering that I suppose I see what I'm doing through a very different optic. First, talking about giving in to despair strikes me as the wrong way to put it. That metaphor connotes losing a struggle. But why should entering a state of despair be conceptualized as failure? It is simply and complexly an emotion we embrace among the myriad others that make humans human. I don't get why at this turn in history we would want to repress, distract, or self-medicate ourselves away from a frantic sense of helplessness. This is, after all, who we have become. This is what we have done to ourselves. We reside in the city of extremists, among a flood of antidepressants, conspiracy theories, new age quackery, the consequence of our society's choices, and that feels bewildering and dismal. Examining and articulating our despair, not working through it as our pop psychologists recommend, but embracing it, these personal and social traumas without end, is an essential part of what it means not to heal but rather to be a thoughtful, fully feeling individual. Second, and this may sound paradoxical in light of what I just said, engaging in defiant narrativity and reminding ourselves that trying to maneuver through the world using someone else's choreography is both dangerous and deadening, in reminding our students in the classroom and our readers outside its doors that we don't have to live this way that we can continually at least imagine the act of rewriting our scripts, despite the evidence, despite the untellables, at least locally. Engaging in defiant narrativity is the precise inverse of despair, or rather a further complication of despair's complications. I often wonder if it is syntax and grammatical encumbrance that are to blame for our belief that we can only experience one category of emotion at a time. This puts me in mind of how searingly Carol Mazo expresses a related idea in her essay, World Book. We write now into our extinction with surprising reserves of energy, 
perversely embracing the motion toward our disappearance. From the erasures, from the negations, from the violence and assaults and trespasses and betrayal, from the love for all that passes, the novel and new forms will persist. It alone has the potential of coming closer than any other human document to the poignancy and terror of the moment. As I recite those lines, I'm thinking of Steve Tomasula's novel, Ascension, which appears in August in the US. Typical of his explorations, it is an act of lavish research and penetrating critical thought, an advanced report sent back from the library of the future. In this case, about how humans invent nature, uh, even as their conception of nature invents their thinking and thus their reality. The first chapter tells that instant on the cusp of Darwin remaking the natural world. The second tells that instant in the 80s when the nature of nature translates from analog to digital. And the third and final chapter tells that instant of our contemporary where humans have begun to become anachronisms. In other words, ascension tackles the cataclysms of colonization, digitization, and our encroaching extinction by examining how nature occurs, not as some sort of objective out there, but rather as a substantiation of species subjectivity. At the same time, ascension tackles what history feels like at a scale where homo sapiens are gradually becoming the size of stray thoughts. As with most of Thomas Sula's work, Ascension merges text and images. Each page of the first chapter seeded with 19th century illustrations of so-called nature. The third, uh, I'll show you another one there. Uh, and then the third chapter is seeded with QR codes to access various databases documenting our decline from mass shootings to the extinction clock. Um, and an interactive version um, of the third chapter uh, appears there on uh, line. It's still being worked on, but it, 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 it shall be functioning by August. Um, I'm also thinking of one of the most intriguing post-genre texts from the last few years, um, the Canadian poet, novelist, performance artist, M. Norbese Phillips, Zong. Uh, which appeared in 2008 and which dwells in a literary space committed to extreme innovation in the service of social justice. Zhang untells the narrative of the eponymous merchant ship that in 1781 sailed from the west coast of Africa with 442 slaves and 17 crew members on board. Due to poor navigation, the usually nine week voyage ended up taking twice that long. The result was water ran short and sickness proliferated. To preserve some of what the captain called its African cargo, the crew began to throw ill slaves overboard. Many of those still in good health witnessing the massacre before them committed suicide by throwing themse uh, themselves into the sea. So somewhere between 130 and 150 drowned. Upon the ship's arrival in Jamaica, its owners made a claim to the British use, uh, insurers for a loss of cargo. The insurers refused to pay, the case went to trial, and the judgment came back that the deliberate siling, uh, killing of slaves was legal. Consequently, the insurers were obliged to pay out. There is no telling this story, Phillips launches her essay on how she came to write Zong. How she asks, does one go about narrativizing the unimaginable? Her answer is to take on the legal document from the trial, the judicial institutional so-called rational version of what transpired, and to detonate it across Zong's pages dismantling its language and presuppositions, both at the levels of thematics and form, 
as she termites forward into a text comprised of six smaller ones, a glossary, the ship's fictitious manifest, um, and Philip's own notes about her unwriting. The outcome is, uh, she says, in equal parts, song, moan, shout, oath, ululation, curse, and chant, mourning as archival undoing, an enraged ghost story that emulates the thoughts and experiences of the slaves whose, whose thoughts and experiences cannot be emulated, thus generating a fugal counter-narrative a documentary poetics that chronicles America's cruel forensic landscape, fully acknowledging the, contradic uh, the contradictions inherent in such a gesture. Having completed the book rendition of Zong, uh, Philip spilled its text into the world by means of days-long collaborative performances begun on each anniversary of the massacre. Her project is a work, then, of historiographic metafiction, a narratological mode close to my own heart, whose goal is to trouble the very idea of pastness, what is told, from what angle, how, and from what centers of power, not in order to reclaim history, but rather in order to explore how history is always about the impossibility of truth recovery. Now, I want to conclude by talking about something else going on in these texts. The cognitive psychologist and psycholinguist Steven Pinker calls fiction empathy technology, a magnificent phrase um, intimating that one reason we read is to inhabit in ways no other art can, right? Every, every art can do something that other arts can't and can't do something that other arts can. Um, what fiction can do is to inhabit the consciousness of other human beings for extended periods, to live among their thoughts, feelings, and experiences, and to appreciate again and again that reading can be an act not only of overt political resistance, but also of human compassion, which, after all, is another kind of political resistance. Yet I don't think that's exactly how things work. I see the texts I've been discussing engaged in doing something different. They are, I would suggest, teaching us that unproblematized empathy, a word that tracks back through the German Einfühlung, meaning feeling at one with, which is, was coined in 1858 by the philosopher Rudolf Lotze as a translation of the Greek empatheia, which means to suffer with another, that unproblematized empathy is an impossibility. After all, how can we possibly gain deep knowledge of another when such a goal stands outside our reach even when talking about ourselves? The fact is we spend our lives making the discovery over and over again that the idea of gaining full self-understanding amounts to a utopian undertaking. How in the world could we therefore possibly attempt to understand, let alone share the feelings of another human being whose gender, race, geopolitical and economic position, education, socio-historical moment, and so on, are always already, always already uh, utterly removed from our own? My point, of course, isn't that we should give up trying. Rather, the texts I've been discussing contend through their form as well as their content that as we wander deeper and deeper into our culture's atrocity exhibition, we should attempt to situate radical empathy inside our classrooms and out in our experimental writing practices and the practices comprising our daily existences, even as we know we absolutely cannot even as we know we absolutely must, even as we know chasing empathy will unremittingly lead us toward conflicted and confounding educations into the heart of the heart of failure, which are simultaneously the most beautiful educations imaginable into countless instances of brief, fraught, desperately inadequate instance of hope.